The title of the presentation comes from Tina Turner's theme song to Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, in which she proclaims, we don't need another hero beyond the Thunderdome, which I guess is great for her and all the post-apocalyptic people in the movie. But for us who live in the really real world, we certainly need another hero. This presentation is going to be about Asian representation in the superhero genre. And you could probably do the same kind of presentation for any minority group that is not well represented in superhero comics. So the LGBT community, the Latino community, the African American community, the regularly proportioned women community, which is pretty much everyone. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's get into this. Um, so uh, if you're watching this on my channel or on my website, you probably know who I am. But for those of you new to this, uh, my name is Jamie Noguchi. I'm a DC area cartoonist and illustrator. Um, I have a webcomic called Yellow Peril, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, and I'm one of the co-creators of Super Art Fight, the greatest live art competition in the known universe. And this is a presentation um, I gave to uh, the local Mensa gathering. And I thought it might be cool to kind of put it up online. So the first question, is do superheroes really matter? Like, is is all this complaining about lack of representation pointless because we're talking about something that doesn't matter? Do heroes matter in a modern sense? And of course, I think they do. Uh, I wouldn't be doing this presentation if I didn't think superheroes mattered. Um, but to me, superheroes embody um, intangible values that a society holds up as things to aspire to. Values like truth, justice, and the American way, which is why Captain America is there and not Superman, because I never knew why Superman represented the American way and not Captain America. Anyway, um, they can also um, tell stories and teach us about high concepts like the notion that with great power comes great responsibility as evidenced in all the, uh, the Spider-Man comics and movies. And they can also help us deal with our personal issues um, the enemy within, such as the demon in a bottle storyline in Iron Man, where Tony Stark deals with his alcoholism and how it's affecting his life and destroying it, basically. Um, so I, I feel like superheroes are great at, at telling us these morality tales, um, tales about values, and, and breaking it down into simple terms that we can understand, that, that are somewhat universal, that anyone can just sit down and read about Spider-Man and, and understand what it means to have great power and great responsibility. Um, so why why should superheroes be diverse? Well, if you are a white dude or a hypersexualized woman, you are very well represented in superheroes. But for the rest of us, after years and years of reading about people who don't look like us, who don't have um, the same background that we do, and, and I'm Asian, I should have mentioned that before, but um, I'm half Japanese, half Chinese. Um, so growing up reading about superheroes that don't come from similar backgrounds as we do, uh, even though superheroes represent universal values that societies hold up, um, it can sometimes feel like these are for other people and not me. So um, you can tend to feel like an outsider if you don't have heroes representing what you believe in or, or where you're from. Uh, now what I, I don't like to see is tokenism and tokenism is when you have a character who shows up from uh, a minority group and the only reason they're there is because they are the minority like the their minority ism defines who they are so in the case of Asians what does an Asian token look like well this is a <laughs> this is my little visual joke for the piece it's a 500 yen piece um, but there are basic five basic archetypes of an Asian token and if you see a character show up and it fits into one of these characters, char um, character archetypes, chances are they are a token and that's not what we're looking for. And, and you see this a lot in not only in comics, but in movies, television, um, all sorts of entertainment. So the martial artist is an obvious archetype. You've got your Bruce Lee. You've got anyone who is there just because they are the martial arts expert. Um, they're definitely token. Uh, the brains. This is a, another stereotype that is uh, well represented in movies and comics. The, the smart Asian. The temptress or the dragon lady. Anytime you have a geisha 
type character or femme fatale wandering around um, in skimpy outfit with a knife and she's Asian. This is that archetype. Um, the alien or the outsider, the person who is there to translate because it's an ancient Asian language or an ancient Asian custom. Um, this is the type of character, um, the outsider archetype. And finally, we have the scheming trickster, which comes from the days of the Yellow Peril and Fu Manchu and um, the um, Ming the Merciless, all of these ancient evil oh even the mandarin all of these ancient chinese mystical evil characters that are scheming and plotting to take the white women and do all sorts of stuff um so these are the five archetypes that show up a lot when asian characters when asian superheroes come to the come onto the scene um so what we're going to do now is is take a brief survey of asian superheroes throughout the the different ages of comic books and this is by no means an extensive survey. I, I pick and chose characters because of their popularity or, or familiarity. Um, there, there were a lot more than I thought there were when I was doing research for them, but I didn't want to um, turn this into like an eight hour talk. So um, it's by no means going to be extensive. And if I'm missing some of your favorites, I'm sorry, um, but here we go. Uh, and we usually, when we usually talk about the history of comic books, we talk about the ages and the ages relate to various metals. So the golden age, was from circa 1938 to 1950. This is the era where comics were still fighting Nazis and the dirty Japs. So we don't really have many positive um, Asian characters showing up Asian, Asian superheroes in a positive light. So we'll just move on to the Silver Age, which was from 56 to 1970. And the funny thing about the ages of comics is as, as we get more modern, the, the metals get less precious, I guess. The implication being that comics sucked, uh, suck more as we get closer to modern age. I don't think that's true. I think I think comics are actually getting better in some respects, but that's beside the point. Anyway, we will start off with Wong. I am not a fan of Wong. Um, Wong is the servant to the Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange, and besides folding his laundry and, and taking his coat, his only other skill is that he's the master of Kamar Taj martial arts from the Kamar Taj temple, which is a made up fucking place in Malaysia somewhere. And uh, Wong talks like this. Forgive a master, officer of the law wishes to see you. It's terrible, 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 terrible. Not awesome. Um, and look at that. He, he's drawn like an alien. Uh, not a fan of Wong. Uh, the karate kid. <laughs> So this is a character from the uh, the the late '60s, predates Ralph Macchio. Um, his real name is Val Armor, uh, which is pretty crazy. He's the son of a yakuza and an American secret agent. So that lets the artist draw him in a way that's not necessarily Asian, like with the strong chin line, because oh, he's half white. So maybe that's the 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 chin is the dominant trait there. Um, but. Uh, he his main power is that he's the master of every martial art that was developed in the 31st century including something called super karate which sounds fucking terrible <laughs> so yeah karate kid um next we go on to the bronze age from 1970 to uh 1985 and um we will start off with sunfire fire now sunfire was actually the first um Asian superhero that I had ever seen. Um, there was this uh, cartoon, uh, The Amazing Spider-Man and Friends. It starred Spider-Man, Firestar, and Iceman. And there was one episode where Fire, uh, where Sunfire showed up, which was kind of cool because I, before then, I, I didn't know that there were Asian superheroes in the Marvel universe, but there turned out to be one, Sunfire. Um, now I kind of, I'm not a fan of his costume. In this iteration, he's got the the rising sun emblem going on with the the sun and the stripes, and that harkens back to the days of World War II, uh, when Japan was um, con trying to you know being militaristic power. They had the the sun with the rising rays as their symbol. So I mean, it's it's not necessarily the equivalent of the swastika flag, but it's still not something that you want to represent as. You know being Japanese but whatever um, so this is Sunfire he was a mutant born with solar radiation powers 
How did he get these powers? Because his mother survived the bombing of Hiroshima, and uh, the radiation somehow filtered down to her womb, and before she died of radiation sickness, she gave birth to Sunfire, who has the power to absorb light energy and shoot it back out. So we've got the outsider trope right there. He's uh, And we've got the martial arts trope because, of course, he knows um, kendo, judo, and karate. Um, but Sunfire is um, always the outsider. Like there, There's an arc where... Um, he has to team up with the X-Men, but because he's such a prick and because he's so arrogant, um, he doesn't really join the team. So he's he's perpetually the outsider, perpetually the, the token martial artist. And, um, you know, he tries, but he's, he's not really a good representation for us. Uh, next, we have another stellar example of tokenism in Shang-Chi, master of motherfucking kung fu. And he is basically Bruce Lee uh, with a terrible costume. He's the son of Fu Manchu, who is the basis for the fiendish scheming archetype. Like, it doesn't get more yellow parally and token than fucking Fu Manchu. And Shang-Chi is the son of Fu Manchu. Somehow he overcame his evil instincts and became a, a, a fighter for justice. His powers are that he knows all the kung fu and he is a master of chi so it's not just a fun name shang chi <laughs> chi i i fucking hate shang chi he's he's terrible no good uh then we have a character called katana uh again with the rising sun symbolism on her boob which kind of looks like a target uh it's not it's not the best um her, her updated costume for the new 52 has a, a dot right in the middle of her forehead. And I know it's supposed to represent the, the sun of the Japanese flag, but it looks like a fucking target. So her old costume, you have a target on her boob. Her new costume, you have a target on her head. It's not, it's not, the, very, it's not the best. Um, and her storyline, her origin is really depressing. Her entire family is killed. Her husband is killed by his jealous brother because the brother wanted to marry her instead and uh, the brother kills the husband with the sword called the soul taker and the soul taker steals the soul of anyone it kills so katana has a sword with the soul of her husband in it that talks to her when she's going out and killing things uh, and that's pretty awful. That's pretty tough. It, that's not what you want in an origin story. So I kind of feel bad for Katana. It's it's not awesome. Plus, she's got the femme fatale thing going on because she's um, dressed provocatively, and then she's got the whole martial artist thing. So it's 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 a whole mess. It's a, it's a. I feel really bad for Katana. She deserves better. She deserves better. Um, a side note: Soul Taker is forged by the legendary swordsmith. Muramasa. Now there were two famous swordsmiths in Japanese lore, Muramasa and Masamune, and um, they were both known as the best swordsmiths in the world. The, the biggest difference is that the Muramasa blades are evil and they have evil spirits. So her blade is, is from this legendary um, swordsmith that's actually part of Japanese legend. Um, so let us uh, move beyond the Bronze Age and we're going to the modern age from 1985 up until current times. Uh, in this era, I kind of, as I was doing research, I kind of got the feeling that um, the comic book companies, Marvel and DC, were kind of getting on board, understanding that some of the past representation of Asian heroes ne wasn't necessarily the best. So we have um, a lot better origins um, characters power sets that don't necessarily relate to them being asian and we just have better characters in general so we'll kick this off with jubilee now jubilee is a valley girl she was chinese american born in beverly hills she's kind of a mall rat and um her power set uh, she's able to generate fireworks from her fingers and explode things so her origin has nothing to do with her being asian her power set has nothing to do with being Asian. She's not she's not the the vampy seductress type character trying to seduce people to to get her way. Um, she's just a, a a kid with mutant powers. 
um, which is awesome. Jubilee is one of my favorite characters from this era. She's just a cool kid with superpowers who happens to be Asian. That is exactly what I am looking for when I talk about diversity in superheroes. Um, next up is Psylocke, and this is kind of a cheat. Psylocke doesn't really belong, um, but I wanted to talk about her because there's an, there's an interesting phenomenon that you rarely see in anything. So um, she is the sister of Captain Britain, so she's British, so she's a white girl. Um, but somewhere in the late 80s, she turned into a Japanese assassin, so she is now this ninja. Um, her 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 mind is inhabited uh, this this assassin Quanon or whatever her name is. I I didn't read the story arc, but all of a sudden, Psylocke was drawn as an Asian ninja with purple hair and this bodysuit thing going on and boobs forever. Um, so pre ninja when she was Betsy Braddock. Um, she had telekinetic powers, and the way you could see they were activated is the, the artist would usually draw um, a, a butterfly around her eyes, which is kind of a cool effect. That's how you knew her powers were turned on. Um, and she could, you know, see into people's minds, stun them, uh, manipulate them, that kind of thing. Post Ninja, she has martial arts skills, and her psychic powers are now concentrated into psychic knives, which she wields from her fists, and she uses them to stab in. To people's heads and, and shock them and turn them off. This is one of those rare occasions of yellow washing and I you probably never hear that term very often because it doesn't happen often. Uh, you're probably more familiar with the term whitewashing and that is when you get a character who is written as Asian or written as a minority and then when it's turned into a film or a television series the recast as white. That is whitewashing. You rarely find it going the other way around. In this case, Psylocke has been yellow washed because she starts out white and then all of a sudden becomes Asian. And even though she fits into the martial arts stereotype and the, the dragon lady stereotype, it's still kind of amusing to me to see uh, Betsy Braddock being yellow washed. So that's why she's here. Um, next we have Ryan Choi, who's a DC character. And he is the fourth person to carry the mantle of the Atom. A lot of times, especially in the DC universe, um, character mantles get passed down um, from from character to character. Like there are a bajillion Robins. Uh, a couple of different people have worn the mantle of Batman. Um, Starman, there have been a couple of Starman, Firestorm. So, you know, DC likes to shift their characters around. Um now, he is a child prodigy from Hong Kong, so he does kind of fit the brain's stereotype, um, but his power set has nothing to do with being Asian. He can shrink in size, he can manipulate his weight, all that kind of stuff. So, so that's kind of cool. Ryan Choi, um, pretty, pretty good at him. There was some controversy because uh, he was killed off in, in one of the recent storylines, and that kind of pissed off a lot of people. Um, but Ryan Choi is pretty good. We're getting there. And uh, finally, we have Amadeus Cho from the Marvel Universe, and uh, he too is a child genius. So he does fit the brain's stereotype, um, and but I mean, it, it's more like he's he's a really smart kid. Um, he's like a teenager. He's he's basically just like a teenager. He can perform, you know, high high level calculations in his head, but afterwards he needs to eat. So he's just like any other teenager, constantly in need of food. And recently, he was promoted to Prince of Power after Hercules' death, which puts him in the Olympic pantheon, uh, which has more to do with Greek mythology than anything Asian, which is kind of cool. You, I would never have assumed or thought that uh, a Korean-American kid would become uh, Olympian god or something like that. So um, Amadeus Cho is a, is a pretty cool, cool character. Um, but... You know, so that's that's a brief a brief look at the history of Asian superheroes. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really difficult to relate to people who can punch through concrete. Um, so uh, while it's taken a while for superheroes to catch up to what I would like to see in terms of of uh, representation without tokenism, if you look beyond the superhero genre, other comics have been doing it very, very well, and this is the part of the part of the presentation where I get to pimp out web comics and stuff from people I like, and even my own stuff. So, um, 
So I'm going to talk about a couple of books, uh, and this is, again, very extremely brief survey. It's not extensive at all. Uh, but first up is Shattered, which is an anthology of stories. Um, it's a non-superhero anthology. It's actually the second one. Um, this group um, put together a, a previous anthology called Secret Identities that focused on Asian superheroes, all original superheroes. Um, I, I can't really recommend that first anthology because it was very, it was very angry. A lot of the stories were very angry um, and very uh, in your face kind of thing. Like, um, and even I felt like it w there wasn't a wider audience for the book. Like, even me being Asian, I was uncomfortable reading a lot of the stories, and I couldn't imagine giving this book to anybody who wasn't Asian. Like, a lot of the stories really felt alienating. Uh, there were a couple of, of good ones in there that, that weren't so um, antagonistic, um, but I, I'm not sure that that was the direction um, that they initially wanted to go with it. So uh, don't don't pick up the first one. Pick up this one, Shattered. Um, this one is great. It, it's broken down into five chapters uh, that represent the five archetypes, the brute, the temptress, the brain, the alien, and the manipulator. And um, the stories within each chapter um, are you know different spins of those archetypes or you know a refutation of those archetypes or just a, a different way of looking at it and they're they're really good stories um, and it, it doesn't it doesn't make you feel like ashamed for not being Asian when you read them <laughs> like I felt the first book kind of did um, but uh, I have a story in there I did some artwork for the master and master tortoise and master hare written by Howard Wong which is a reinterpretation of the tortoise and the hare story set in, um, in uh, ancient China where all the characters are animals. So imagine if Usagi Yojimbo took place in China and it was all about Kung Fu instead of the way of the samurai. So of course I had to draw that one. That was, that was awesome. Um, so yeah, check that out. It's in stores now. <laughs> uh, next up is Tune by Derek Kirk Kim. And it's kind of, when you're reading this, you kind of feel like it's... Uh, autobiographical because it stars this cartoonist Andy Go, um, and it was serialized online now most of the time when a web cartoonist when a cartoonist decides they want to publish on the web they get a couple of strips together they get a domain and then they start putting it up and then maybe after like five six ten years they start getting paid for their work through ads or book sales or whatever Derek Kirk Kim is smarter than all of us because he got his publisher first second to buy the first two books and agree to serialize them online before they went to publication. So um, I have no idea if the publishing strategy worked. Uh, like I, I don't know what his numbers are, but I can only imagine they were they were great or they did well because I mean it's a great story and uh, it that's a that's a great way to to do a web comic. Um, but like I said, it stars Andy Go, who's a struggling independent cartoonist, and he agrees, um, he pines after a girl, and, and it's a kind of a unrequited love story, until he decides to accept a job um, from these aliens to appear in their zoo. So it kind of takes a, a, a mystical, like sci-fi um, twist uh, towards the middle of it and 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 which is really cool um, the other thing about tune is that Derek Kirk Kim put together a web series called mythomania um, which is sort of like an alternate reality like what if Andy Go did not decide to sign with the aliens but instead stayed on earth what would his life be like and he's filmed the first season and you can find that on YouTube and it's really funny you get a little bit of insight to what it's like being a struggling indie cartoonist <laughs> it felt very relatable for me <laughs> um and uh the second season should be coming out soonish i think he ran a kickstarter for that and um i think they're in post-production now so uh, but definitely check it out it's a pretty good story um you know it it doesn't wear its asianness on its sleeve it doesn't bash you over the head with like this is asianness it's uh it's just a really good story starring a character who happens to be asian um, next up is Johnny Wander from Ananth Panagaria and Yuko Ota. And this is kind of a cheat because um, it's an autobio journal comic and both of them happen to be Asian. Um, but they call it a Charm of Life comic, 
which is serialized at johnnywander.com. And to me, this is pretty much the best journal comic ever. It, it's, it's just them and their friends and their family hanging out in New York and their adventures in New York and um, going to visit people and, and their friends become characters in the strip and their, and their parents become characters in the strip. And it's all just, uh, you know, a, a good fun, uh, it's a good read. It's a good fun read. You should all check it out if you're at all interested in, in journal comics. It makes me want to draw better comics, like reading their stuff. Um, but they, they find the charm in, in the simplest things, like going to the grocery store or ordering coffee or uh, petting a cat, you know. And, and they turn into these wonderful little tales. And uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great comic, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, Shortcomings by Adrian Tomine is kind of tough. Um, <clears throat> so if, if this comic fell into one of those categories, I would say that it, it kind of feel it falls into the alien outsider um, category. It, it definitely deals with what it's like to be Asian um, in, in America and, and how do you fit in and all this kind of stuff. It stars this guy, Ben Tanaka, who is kind of a, a self-hating Asian, I guess. Um, he's dating a girl uh, Miko Hayashi, who is very active in the Asian American community. She hosts an Asian American film festival and, and she, um, is very active in the community and he kind of scoffs at her. It's just like, well, what the hell is going on? And this, is, this isn't such a big deal. Why are you so up on your Asian-ness? And, and at the same time, he's making fun of her. He pines after this blonde girl who works at the theater that he owns. Um, he's almost embarrassed about being Asian. And um, you can you can get his entire character motivation by this opening s phrase that he utters. Why does everything have to be some big statement about race? And that's basically Ben Tanaka in a sentence. And it's kind of this one was difficult for me to read because um, I, I felt like it reflected a lot of my earlier views on on um, being different and growing up in a, a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, you know, I was always, I always felt like the outsider, you know, but I always wanted to be part of the group. So I, I, I tried to deny everything that was Asian, you know, it, it's, it's really tough. Um, I, I encourage everyone to pick this book up. Um, but I'm just warning you, it's, it's a tough read. Um, very good stuff. Um, uh, Adrian Tomine's stuff is in general fucking phenomenal. Um, and I, I really appreciate all of his stuff. So check it out uh and finally we have yellow peril which is my comic now the title comes from a little used racial slur against asian uh asians that was used like in the 30s and the 40s and stuff we don't hear it very often but i felt like i could reclaim it because i don't know why <laughs> um but it's serialized three times a week at ypcomic.com and um it's kind of like the office but with cursing and uh, it's kind of my response to the fact that the only Asian American sitcom to ever air on network television was All American Girl, starring Margaret Cho, and it it lasted a season maybe. And since then, we've had nothing else. And I always thought that that was a shame because All American Girl was not the best. And so um, the problem is I don't know anyone in Hollywood. I don't have any connections, and there's no way I could ever write a television show. But I can draw comics and I know what it's like to work in an office. So I figured um, I would do the sitcom that I wanted to see, but put it online as a comic. And so this is a an office romance comedy starring three friends who have to deal with their bosses and their personal relationships. And it happens to star people who aren't, you know, necessarily, you know, the, the white stereotypical office worker. Um, and they're not really def defined by their ethnicity. They don't really talk about ethnicity in the in this in the in the comic at all. Because uh, I find in my personal life, when I'm talking with friends, I, I rarely talk about you know ethnicity or race or anything like that. Um, but it's a office. If it's it's a it's a basic office comedy with a lot of cursing and uh, starring Asian people and other minorities. So um, that was my reaction to all of it. Uh, so this is the the part of the presentation where I. S 
ask for questions. Um, if you guys have questions, you can um, post them wherever you find this, like in the comments section of the, the post or if you have a video response or if you want to message me personally or on Tumblr or whatever. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask questions if you have um, anything that you want uh, me to answer. Um, but what I found that that while the lack of Asian superheroes has been quite disappointing in the history of comics, it has inspired a lot of Asian cartoonists to do their own stories. Like, um, you know, we don't have our, we don't have Superman, we don't have Batman, they're not Asian, but we can go off and do our own thing. We can tell the stories that we want to. And the great thing about comics these days, and web comics especially, is that um, we get to tell the stories that we never got to see. Um, so for my example, you know, the fact that we, we only got one Asian American sitcom, I can tell my own version of a sitcom without having to wait for someone else to do it. So I find that there are a lot of um, Asian American car creators who have been inspired by the lack of representation um, to go out and do their own thing, which is really awesome. So that does it for this presentation. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you for tuning in. And again, if you have questions, uh, message me somehow wherever you find this. And uh, I'll try my best to respond. Uh, thanks for checking it out, and I'll check you later.